following program is brought to you by the Ed Snyder Center for Enterprise and Markets at University of Maryland's Robert H. Smith School of Business. Welcome to the Ink Tank. Stay with us to get the inside scoop about technologies that could disrupt and challenge the way you do business. Hello, I'm Christina Elson, and on this edition of the Ink Tank, we'll discuss how the biotech revolution is bringing about a new level of personalized nutrition and could have a profound effect on the global food supply. My guest today, Dr. Taylor Wallace, is the CEO of Think Healthy Group, which utilizes research to create a healthier generation of consumers around the globe. Good morning, Taylor. It's so great to have you here with me in the Ink Tank, and I'm really looking forward to our discussion today around food science. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, so let's just jump into some a couple of big themes that we're going to address today. Um, one of the things that we were talking about is the idea that we're, because of technology, we're getting to the point where we can do such a phenomenal job really detecting on an individual level uh, some of the uh, th ways that people both respond to nutrition. And we can also do that in a way through looking at food, you know, uh, much better analyses of food. But but let's start with individuals. So what what are some of the things we're learning about nutrition, like individuals and nutrition that we want to really think about? Well, look, I think everything's going personalized, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you see the 23andMe's out there. I just bought a biome where you can assess your own microbiome uh, in your gut uh, just by, you know, either a finger prick if it's 23andMe or, you know, a fecal sample if it's the biome. I just bought another one of the kits where you can prick your finger and give them a blood spot and they'll tell you whether you have an intolerance to, you know, about 150 different foods. So some really neat technologies out there still kind of riding like the regulatory line because I don't think <laughs> FDA's kind of figured out how we're going to like regulate this when people are self-diagnosing with, you know, different disease states and things like that. So if you remember 23andMe got dinged by FDA and so now you have to actually go in and look at your own genetic sequence and type it into Google and figure out what the different um, single nucleotide polymorphisms or, or morphs in your own DNA mean. Mm -hmm. um, but I definitely think it's moving that way. And one of the areas that I think is really exciting is in the dietary supplement space. And what I see in the next five, ten years, probably even sooner than that, is a company coming out and saying, okay, let's do a blood spot test. Let's look at your uh, DNA and let's figure out exactly what level of each nutrient that you need, either from the diet or here's a customized multivitamin for you. I think there's really wild possibilities out there. So from the business perspective, this is very interesting because we have a lot of different companies that are investing in in perfecting different techniques. So on the one hand, we're talking about um, al you know al allergies, so doing a spit test and figuring out what you're allergic to, um, doing biome testing. So um, from a business perspective, it's still right now the role of the individual to sort of bring all this information together in a way that it can be used for a really individual diagnosis. And so who who could help someone make that diagnosis, like really sift through all this information, understand like the outcomes of the different tests, and then think through like, well, what does this mean for me? Right. Well, I think that role is really going to fall on doctors and medical professionals, and I think that's going to take a whole different level of training, especially when it comes to nutrition, because doctors, as you know, are not trained in nutrition. They don't even take a nutrition 101 course no, during I didn't their know medical that. training. <laughs> okay. So it, it's actually quite scary sometimes uh -huh. what doctors will tell you about nutrition. My dad uh, goes to two different doctors, has been diagnosed with Parkinson's disease, and one doctor tells him, take a multivitamin, take as many dietary supplements as you want. If you get too much, you'll just pee everything out, mm -hmm. which is scary because we know <laughs> vitamin toxicities exist. And then, on the other hand, the other doctor tells him, don't take a multivitamin, it'll give you cancer. And so that just kind of shows, <laughs> well. the, you know, the broad spectrum of, you know, doctors get a lot of their medical or, or the, a lot of their information on nutrition from TV shows 
and you know from different magazines things like that they're not necessarily trained in that field and that's really where i think the dietitian comes into play so we definitely have opportunities as what i'm hearing you say for people who are really focused on um, helping people understand the outcomes of and let's just like do some term definition because we're talking about allergies right which are um you know i i might have an allergic reaction to certain kinds of food or medicine, right? Right. And uh, or I might have a genetic disposition towards something, right? Or I might um, uh, have uh, some sort of unique microbiome, or right. so. Like, just talk us through a little bit, and then we were talking about polymorphism, you know, that concept right. too. So, just talk us a little bit through, like these different kind of areas and yeah. what 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 is it right so the reason it's really hard is because you know when you have a 23 me test uh-huh. or you know any one of these you know genetic tests they have to be approved by FDA. So, you know, if you have the alleles for Alzheimer's disease or Parkinson's disease, FDA actually has to validate that tool that you're using to diagnose that. Mm-hmm. And so, as you know, You know, these genetic tests are telling you about hundreds of different diseases and what predisposes you to them. And just because you have the genetic sequence doesn't necessarily mean you're going to get it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you can have the genes for breast cancer and never develop breast cancer. I think of genes as kind of like a light switch, you know, and nutrition plays a really important role in that because, you know, a lot of times when you have a high saturated fat diet or a high Um, sugar diet, something like that, you can turn those light switches on that you don't want on. Mm -hmm. But if you have appropriate nutrition, you can keep that off and keep those genes Mm down-regulated. So that's why nutrition is so important from a prevention perspective. Um, You know, when it comes to the genetic testing, it, it gets hard because I can tell you off a genetic test what microbes you have in your system, but with the current regulations, I can't really tell you you know, what those microbes could actually do to you long term. So we know that like high levels of E. coli are present in people with Crohn's disease. Mm -hmm. Um, But I can't diagnose you with Crohn's disease based upon your E. coli levels, you know, based upon a a consumer test. So it's getting it's getting really tricky in what companies are saying. And consumers have to kind of go fishing for their own information. Mm -hmm. The other area that's really neat in the nutrition side of things when it comes to these genetic testing is are, you know, everybody handles nutrients differently. And we think like, oh, I got to get my calcium 1200 milligrams a day Mm -hmm. because that's what's on the food label uh, as your daily value. But that's not necessarily true for everybody. If you're a smaller female, you probably need less. If you're a larger male, you probably need more. If you're working out, you know, you're metabolizing nutrients, you know, a lot more efficiently than somebody who's sedentary. Genetics mean everything, and I've been doing a lot of work in the area of choline, Mm -hmm. and choline is a B vitamin that we didn't even know was an essential nutrient really until 1998, so it's a very new field, and it's very closely related to folate and folic acid. Okay. And so it's really, choline's really important in um, neurocognitive development, particularly in infants. The interesting thing about choline is you see... Once we started fortifying the food supply with folic acid to prevent neural tube defects in infants or spina bifida, Mm -hmm. is more commonly what it's called, um, you see a drop in uh, spina bifida or neural tube defects, but it's still present. And that's because about 40% of premenopausal women in the U.S. have a genetic polymorphism, which is just a substitution in their DNA where they can't metabolize folate correctly. Uh Uh, So either their requirement is much, much higher Mm -hmm. than the general population, or, um, you know, in some cases they have a real problem metabolizing it and you need another vitamin that can donate a methyl group because that's very important in closing the neural tube in an infant. Mm -hmm. And choline is the, uh, the vitamin that can do that. Unfortunately, 90% of us don't get enough choline, and we showed that a few years ago. And then more recently, we showed that 92% of pregnant women in the U.S. don't get enough choline. Uh Super important. It's not part of a prenatal vitamin because it's like calcium. It's big and bulky. You have to take your own pill. The American Medical Association just last year 
uh, deemed choline as a vitamin that all um, prenatal supplements should contain. Uh-huh. Of course, it can't, you know, it can't contain your daily value of it because it's so bulky. You have to take the other pill. That's what AMA sure. didn't realize. Yeah. So, so let's talk a little more about that because it's so important. I mean, I know as a, a person who is, you know, aging, <laughs> that <laughs> you know, they tell you, okay. You need calcium, but you also need these vitamins that help you metabolize the calcium, you know, right. and things like that. So choline is, you know, and okay, we've known about this these calcium issues, but uh, choline is so interesting because we know now that uh, we want you to get more choline, but how do we do that? You know, right. what are the ways if we don't have the dietary supplement sort of regimen or we don't have enough um, experience with right. that. What What are the ways that we need to get choline? Well, so the most practical way in the U.S. diet, the number one source of choline are egg yolks. And mm-hmm. remember when eggs were so bad? Yeah. That was completely <laughs> fake news. <Right. laughs> like eggs are like one of the most nutritionally sound foods out there. And you have to eat the yolk. Uh-huh. Most of the vitamins and minerals in the egg are contained within the yolk. Mm-hmm. So They're really a nutrition powerhouse, and we showed that if you eat two eggs a day, two whole eggs, whether they're scrambled or, you know, hard-boiled or whatnot, then you can get your choline requirements. What's also interesting in these pregnant women, uh, my friend Marie Cottle at Cornell University Mm -hmm. just completed a study where she looked at, well, actually the study is quite old, Um, she looked at... Um, supplementing women during their third trimester with choline. Okay. So she got them and she supplemented them at two times the recommended level. So the control group was the recommended level, so Mm -hmm. 450 milligrams per day. Yeah. And the uh, treatment group was like 975 milligrams per day. Yep. The ones in the treatment group on the higher dose of choline, the infants at age six months like had better information processing speed, showed better signs of developing, better neuronal development. And then guess what? She just followed up with these infants at age seven and the kids at age seven that were on the higher choline dose Mm -hmm. um, had better academic outcomes, uh, better learning ability. So it just goes to show the power of nutrition very early on and how some of these Uh, genetic polymorphisms can be overcome Mm -hmm. by just having the right types of foods introduced into your diet. Yeah. So let's go back to that because we were talking about how, you know, our grandparents were very much like they generally ate a lot of everything. I mean, I remember my grandmother who lived to be very old in her late 90s you know, she would just say everything in moderation. And of course, that included like smoking cigarettes and drinking. Right. I mean, <laughs> right. well, maybe we don't need to be doing that. But anyway, but hey, but uh, so, you know, it goes back to this idea of um, moderation. And we still don't understand how individuals metabolize certain kinds of food. And we are omnivores and we need a broad spectrum diet is sort of what I'm hearing you say until we sort of figure out some of this. Well, and, you know, the whole plant versus animal diet has been really hot in the news right now. Uh And I will tell you that going vegan or vegetarian is just not a good idea. Mm -hmm. I mean, I I respect people that do it because of the whole animal rights and they don't want to see, you know, animals get killed and stuff like that. But the bottom line is you got these little canines up here for a reason. We're omnivores, like you said, and that is reflected in our nutritional requirements, right? Mm -hmm. Choline is not present in plant foods for the most part. Brussels sprouts and some cruciferous vegetables have very small amounts, but Mm -hmm. for the most part, we get choline from meats, uh, not many of us eat liver, but it's very high in, in yeah. choline um, and partially because choline is what prevents us from getting fatty liver disease, okay. which is very prevalent in the U.S. In mm-hmm. fact, I've got a theory that most pregnant women have temporary fatty liver disease because of a choline deficiency. Okay. Um, and so, you know. The other thing is, you know, we need more research in the older population. We Mm -hmm. need particularly centurions. And I have to give a shout out today is my uh, great 
aunt's hundredth birthday. So happy birthday, Aunt Nell. Happy uh, birthday. Yeah. <laughs> and, and let me tell you, she still push uh-huh. mows her lawn. Awesome. Like, talk I about strong it. woman. Like, yes. and my grandmother was like that too. I mean, she lived yeah. to be ninety five, and like, you know, talk about a strong Southern woman. Uh-huh. Like, they went through it. They went through the depression. They went through World War Two. Mm-hmm. I mean, talk about two really, really strong, great women that really scratched their way through. And yeah. you know, hundred years old. That's something to yep. really commend. And but it, it is. It's a lot of it has to do with your genetics. A lot of it has to do with your physical activity. Sure. But you know, nutritionally, we know that you know the right types of diet. You know, one of the things that both my grandmother and my great grandmother did, they drank a ton of milk. Right. And yes. you know, we know as you get older that you know that calcium, that vitamin D, protein really plays in to the whole bone health situation and also the sarcopenia situation, right? So, you know, find that one. <laughs> you don't break a hip if you don't fall over. Got it. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, muscle health and and bone health are very under recognized in our society. Mm-hmm. Most people don't realize that 52% of Americans over the age of 50 have either osteoporosis or low bone mass, which mm-hmm. we call osteopenia as well. Okay. So, I mean, it's a big issue right now, and muscle health is is also. And we haven't really figured out how to study it just right. Yeah. But it's, you know, nutrition can definitely prevent stuff like that, and it all goes back to these polymorphisms. You know, if your mother has osteoporosis, you're more genetically prone to have mm-hmm. it. So your calcium requirement's probably higher. And it's not just about calcium. It's about vitamin D that helps you absorb calcium and helps put it into your bones. It's about protein, yeah. which acts as the glue in your bones. It's, you know, about choline. You know, if you look at uh, rat models, of course, we have a really hard time having human models of Alzheimer's disease because you have to follow so many people for so long yeah. to look at Alzheimer's. But there's at least 40 rat studies that are validated um, validated uh, models of Alzheimer's disease that show if you have a high choline diet throughout your life, much lower um, much no lower incidence of Alzheimer's and age-related cognitive decline. And again, yeah. depending on the rat's uh, genome. Right. Yeah. So this is what's so interesting because, you know, what we're talking about really is it's not just – you know, it's not just you, but, you know, what is your family history? And we're at a point where, you know, a lot of us, we can get this test or get that test or but uh, without in in a sense trying to contextualize some of it within our family history, right. we're still missing a piece of that puzzle. Right. We can be missing a piece of that puzzle. And these yeah. tests don't diagnose. They mm-hmm. give you an idea. And like right. I said, it's like the light switch thing. So when my yeah. dad was diagnosed with Parkinson's, I got the 23andMe test because I wanted to see if I had the alleles for it. Because, sure. you know, if I did, yeah. it's really time now that I'm 35 to start thinking about the types of foods I'm eating, the types of exercise that I'm getting. Yep. What do we know currently? about Parkinson's disease that can help prevent it. Yes, exactly. That's a, that's so important. And, I, you know, a lot of things like that, I'm sure we're talking, you know, breast cancer or all sorts of other kinds of right. things that we want to think about there, too. So let's talk a little bit about um, the idea of prevent. So we're, we have a lot of this um, emerging technology to talk about preventative and diagnostic medicine. And in the you know, in the first world, what's so important is that the cost of doing these tests is coming down. And there are a lot of um, a lot of business opportunities, so a lot of companies getting into this. I mean, you know, granted, we still have to work out all these sort of privacy issues. Right, <laughs> if, right. You know, there's all it, 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 it. What's interesting in all these technology areas is things are moving so fast that there's still a little bit of a wild west, right. like who's regulating what and what's not even right. being regulated. And what's accurate and, and what's, what's not. Ac- yeah, exactly. You know, so um, but we want to continue to encourage innovation and right. not just like, you know, jump in there and put a big squash on it. So so as we continue to work that out, we have opportunity to get a lot of really important information on us, on you know us as individuals. Um, so let's talk a little bit about how what we're learning could help us think about uh, the kind of nutrition and the things we can do to improve um, nutrition in areas of the world that we don't have as much information right. about, and we can't necessarily assume that everyone's going to go out and get a 23andMe test or right. a spit test or, or whatever. 
Um, how can we apply either some of what we're learning to other uh, other areas of the world and and or what are some of the challenges that we have when we look at um, the kind of global food market? But let's take the first part right. first and then we'll get back to the sort of global food market issue. Well, right. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's really hard. And, you know, we were talking before the show starts. We're mm-hmm. starting a uh, infant study where we're going to be studying twelve hundred six-month-old infants in Guatemala Mm -hmm. in this indigenous population that's in the mountains. And, you know, the issue is each population is different. The nutritional requirements, because if you think about it, again, genetically, that population is probably very genetically different from a population in Kenya Mm -hmm. or in Southeast Asia. So we know that different ethnicities and different populations react to nutrients differently. Then there's cultural considerations. You know, if you go to India, you know, they culturally don't accept having an egg. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's just a religious thing. There's economical aspects to it. And I think that's really one of the the biggest things, because most people see in the nutrition space, at least, they see industry being, you know, kind of the evil one that's just selling products. I actually see industry being a big part of the solution Mm -hmm. because, you know, industry knows supply chains. And I think that's what's really important when you whether you go into, you know, Guatemala or Kenya or south somewhere in Southeast Asia, knowing what you can get on the supply chain and how you can help them develop economically and self-sustain themselves. I think that's really important. One, because it's it's more solving a longer term problem that we have low income and these people are really poor Mm -hmm. um, versus like, you know, just sending in supplements or sending in food because that's been largely unsuccessful. Because even when you send them foods you and I are used to from the U.S., again, that might not fix the nutrition problem in that particular area of the world. So you kind of have to do the studies to know, you know, what works. And then you have to figure out, okay, if this works, how do I introduce it on the supply chain and make it where it's economical for us to bring, you know, uh, egg farms into Guatemala because they have a lot of choline and they have a high incidence of stunning and, you know, impaired cognitive development in kids. Mm -hmm. So how do we get egg farms in there and get eggs out to people, but also make it something that they can commercialize and, you know, help leverage their own economy? Yeah. And, you know, then there's the social part of it. Yeah. There's a religious part of it. I mean, it's really fascinating. And there's an environmental part of it, too. I mean, we just we got done talking last week at the U.N. about how are we going to save the planet? Agriculture has, you know, a huge effect on greenhouse gas emissions. And with the growing population, that seems to only going to increase. Some people will disagree with that. But, you know, I think it makes sense that more of us on the planet are going to eat more. And. You know, we have to take into account that if you produce an egg here in the U.S., we have a lot of technology behind that to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, to reduce the amount of water and, you know, soil erosion and things like that. You go over to a third world country, they don't have those technologies. So even if you introduce the supply chain, you've still got quite a large environmental impact on there. So we talk about sustainability, but it really has several domains. Yeah, I think that's a very important point because uh, that, you know, technology, we want it to help us produce more efficiently um, and how that uh, is considered in in relationship to local markets and local economies. You know, it's not we we know that you well, we learned, you know, (laughs) a long time ago that you can't just give every kid a computer laptop and you're done. Right. Right. I mean, you can't just give everyone (laughs) an egg factory and you're done. You know, I mean, you really have to to think about how um, that's going to be part of that of that system. So uh, and I really think that's where the Nestle's and the Unilever's mm -hmm. and these big you know, global companies really come into play. You know, we were out at, this is off topic, but we were out at FDA the other day and, you know, they had a public hearing where they want to define healthy, and you know, on products. And Uh that seems like it makes sense to consumers, right? So I can look and see what's considered healthy and FDA would have like a little logo or something Uh, where consumers could tell, oh, this is healthy, I should buy this and Uh feed this to my kids. However, it's like, okay, well, how do we define healthy for one? Because you can put everything into a healthy dietary pattern. And as long as you stay within your calories and, you know, low sure. amount of sugar and saturated fat, it, it, it can be healthy. Um, 
But the issue is supply chains, once mm-hmm. again. So if I'm telling a Unilever or a Nestle, okay, if you add a bunch of vegetables to this dish, this microwavable dish, it's healthy, yeah. right? So vegetables, good. Well, there's not enough bro- broccoli on the food supply chain to do that globally. Yeah. So what is a big company like Unilever or uh, Nestle going to do? They're going to put in potatoes mm. because that's what's available on the supply chain. Mm. That's what's you know shelf stable so they can take it from one place to another. It's easy to incorporate. It's cheap. Mm-hmm. And so now you've got a dish that's full of potatoes. Is that healthy? Yeah. <laughs> I, mean, yeah, so, I know. Yeah. I mean, I really yeah. think we have to be it's careful like, about stuff like yeah. that. And, you know, it even extends to the third world. I mean, if you go over to Kenya, you'll see um, big gated areas where they're studying GMO bananas. And if you've never seen um, Food Evolution that was produced by the Institute of Food Technologists, it gives a great scientific perspective on GMO technology mm-hmm. and what that really means. Um, And you go over to Kenya and they have these molds that grow that basically wipe out the banana supply, which is a huge part of their economy, but also provide a lot of nutrition locally. And, you know, so now scientists have genetically modified these banana trees to resist, you know, certain molds. But it's illegal. GMOs are still illegal in Kenya. Uh So it's, you know, they, they have all these beautiful banana trees growing behind these big, you know, electric fences that no one you know, can eat with the but the monkeys sign, maybe but maybe nobody the monkeys can eat, can eat them, <laughs> i don't right? even know the monkeys can get in there <laughs> right. but like yeah. you know it's really sad because people are really <laughs> scared of technology when it comes to food mm-hmm. you know we'll take any drug you know yes. no matter what side effect it has <laughs> right you know we'll do pretty much anything on our game boy or our computer or stuff like that but when it comes to food people are really scared of technology and you know Technology is going to be what saves the planet. Yeah, that's a good point. Let's talk about that a little bit because the GMO, um, you know, just defining where a bit of a shift that I, I we were talking about, I was seeing in be- the GMO to the idea of applying technologies like CRISPR to right. modify a food. And I thought it was great the way you defined the way both of those work. Um because with GMOs, there has been a lot of reaction to, no, you know, Frankenstein food, you know, and all this right. kind of stuff. And do you think, well, first of all, tell us a little bit about how these are different. And then tell us what you think we're going to see with the with CRISPR as that becomes more and more. Right. And, and the idea is that we really do need people who are willing to invest in the research. And that's going to be, you know... Uh, companies, universities, p- people like that who can actually invest in understanding and right. doc in you know it takes years to figure out even where in the food you might want to right. make these kind of edits. But tell us a little bit about what you see there. Well, so there's a few things. I think CRISPR technology will be more widely accepted because I think as a scientific community and as the food industry, mm-hmm. they have learned from the past. Okay. Right. So, one, when GMOs came out, it was the first of its kind, really great technology, very safe. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, it's the same thing as when we were in middle school and you cross pollinated the little, you know, peas to make the pink flowers versus the white flowers. Mm-hmm. It's the same thing that's in a test tube. So, the whole Franken food thing is not really that relevant because we're not just making up genes, right? If we want a tomato to be purple, we take the purple gene from a blueberry and we put it into the tomato. So it's not like you, you know, wouldn't have that gene if you ate blueberries, right? you know? Yeah. So there's that. Um, you know, I think early on Monsanto had a very bad public image because the U.S. government contracted with them earlier to create Agent Orange. Yeah. So they were not the most widely accepted brand to begin with when GMOs <laughs> came out, yeah. even though they discovered a like uh, probably the technology that is going to sustain and save the world. I mean, it's this technology is really safe, and it's amazing what we can do with it. Mm-hmm. Um, the other thing is, you know, where the food industry really kills itself is marketing. You okay. know who spent more money on the GMO debate uh, than Monsanto? Whole Foods. Uh, because Whole Foods wants GMO to be bad uh, because they want you to pay $2 extra for their apple. Sure. And so there's a marketing thing behind, you know, these industries as well. It's same with Mercola. Okay. I mean, talk about millions and millions of dollars spent 
to sell GMO products, mm-hmm. I mean, that are directly related to the company. Um, so, you know, there's that. Um, I think CRISPR is a little bit different. I think from a consumer perception, CRISPR basically, we're not inserting any new genes. If we don't want the red color in tomatoes, we take our pair of scissors and we cut the DNA strand and we cut out the the red gene mm-hmm. and then we glue the DNA back together. And so we're not introducing anything that might be Franken mm-hmm. um, to cons- in consumers' minds. So I think that you know they might be a little bit more accepting of that. The other thing is I think that the industry is going to get you know a lot smarter. I think that you know the industry very much backed the technology and really fought you know the scared consumers uh, with GMOs. Uh, and I think this time around, you're going to see a lot more education and outreach and helping people to understand. If you see now the industry's moving towards this like smart label where you have the QR code and you can scan it and it'll trace every ingredient back to the farm level mm-hmm. uh, in a product. So consumers have the information that they want. And I'm not so sure consumers are scared of it or they just want the information and they want to understand it a little bit better. And so I think CRISPR technology will be a little bit more smoother because I think we've learned a lot from GMO technology. Yeah, that's a really important point. I mean, as these things change, they, you know, they they do sort of help us understand what consumers want to know, what they feel comfortable with, what kind of education we need to do around different technologies. And, uh, you know, I I think even with... um, uh, CRISPR, one of the interesting things that I read recently, and in, in, I think it was in The Economist, but that uh, there are, for example, corn, uh, you can pull uh, genes out of native uh, species that we're not really growing on a commercial level now, and you can put that into these species in a way that helps these plants do a better job, like fixing nitrogen in the soil, so that you all of a sudden are going to have a much uh, less reliance on using fertilizers and, you know, things like that. Like there are actually real um, uh, follow-on benefits right. to thinking about some of this, not just in modifying the plant, but the fact that that can have real impact on how that system of agriculture can work better. Going back to some of these ideas we were talking about, trying to figure out how to feed a planet, right? Right. Well, and it's really neat to see this on the farm level Mm -hmm. because, you know, there's going to be 11 billion of us on the planet soon. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we're going to have to figure out how to sustain that agriculturally without so many greenhouse gas emissions because, you know, climate change is here and it's pretty – you can't doubt it anymore. I mean, look at this winter that we've had. It's been kind of nuts. One day it, like, snows eight inches, and the next day it's 60 degrees in D.C. Yeah. I mean, it's, yeah. you know, climate change is happening. It's happening. And yeah. so, you know, I, I, look, I think back to when I was a kid, and, you know, there wasn't fluctuations like this. I mean, I, I think it's definitely become apparent. I think the scientific community is in complete consensus that climate change is happening. And I think that technology is going to be the way to, to – for us to get around that, if you look at, um, you know, corn, for instance, or, or just, you know, people think organic so much better. Mm-hmm. But the bottom line is organic is not sustainable. And here's why. I just took a trip out to the canola fields uh, in Canada. Mm-hmm. And if you can imagine, they're absolutely beautiful, the yellow flowers. And, um, you know, we talk with some of the canola farmers and what was really striking to me, because I grew up on a farm in Kentucky that grew GMO soy, beans, uh, wheat, and corn. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we rotated those crops annually. And, you know, I didn't even realize this. I feel bad being a scientist that I didn't even realize this. You know those big sprayer trucks that go by sure. that spray all the awful Roundup on things? Right. The farmer comes in, you know, and is giving us a talk about new agriculture practices and stuff like that, no-till farming, genetic technology, and how it's really saved their crop production in Canada, particularly with canola. Um, one, crop efficiency goes way up, but it goes way up because these big sprayer trucks on a whole football field, they're spraying. He brought out this little mason jar. It looked like a little, um, you know, jelly jar, Uh and it was about half full. Uh And he was like, this is how much Roundup we put on a whole football field. Uh, And it's like, so this has very little environmental impact, Uh Uh, and it kills the weeds when they're you know, very tiny. Yeah. So they only have to do it, you know, a couple of times during the season versus organic. You've got these huge weeds growing. Crop efficiency is only, what, 20% of what, 
you know, you have uh, when you're using sure. Roundup. And, you know, yes, in the 70s, we had chemicals that were very harmful yes. to the soil. But nowadays, I mean, most people don't realize that Roundup is 5,000 times less toxic than table salt. <laughs> so no, it's like we're all worried about friends. consuming pesticides. There was something, you know, all over the news about, oh, we found, you know, Roundup in like beer and wine this week. And it's uh, just like, yeah. and it was like, well, in order to have the toxic dose that they found in rats, you would have to drink a thousand liters of beer a day for like 20 years to get the effect. And it's like, okay, seriously, like technology, we've gotten there to where we can detect these parts per trillion yes that's and, right you know yes, very sensitive uh-huh. but you know toxicity is in the dose right, right? That's so right. things are harmful in the dose you can drink right. too much water and die that's I mean, right. you know that's so right. it's we have to yes we can detect down to these parts per trillion levels now with pretty much anything but does that mean it's going to harm you likely not yeah i feel like you know my when my other grandmother had a beautiful garden in her yard and i always feel like uh, if you you know, really want to try to have a, you know, again, World War II, depression, you know, like gr- you want to eat a grunt in your garden, right. you know, so like you want to do it all like toxic free and, you know, this, that and the other, um, you know, that's that's definitely something that I think it would be, it, it would be nice to see more of these like right. beautiful gardens where people are satisfying these sort of needs um, right. and not always thinking that, you uh, the market has to necessarily provide that, you know, right. for them. But, well, yeah. you know, it, it's kind of I had this discussion with this little group out in Arlington the other week, and it kind of aggravates me because, you know, here in Washington, D.C., we live in this what I call the little rich white woman society. <laughs> like, And it's just like and everybody can shop at Whole Foods and buy their big organic vegetables. And, you know, you can go yeah. walking during the day at lunch and stuff like that. I'm from southwestern Kentucky. And, you know, the average household income in Hopkinsville is seventeen thousand dollars a year. Mm-hmm. And so people, you know, can't just go out and buy fruits and vegetables. Well, one, they're not available. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, it's a food desert. And so what's available are, is you know, a bunch of fast food restaurants on the boulevard. And, you know, the produce in the grocery store is limited. And so, you know, we really have to, like, encourage people to eat, you know, canned fruits and vegetables, frozen fruits and vegetables, which, by the way, frozen fruits and vegetables are typically nutritionally better for you Uh because uh, most fruits and vegetables in the grocery store, if you bit into that tomato and it tastes awful, Uh it's because they're picked green and they're allowed to ripen on the trucks. A lot of foods, a lot of fruits and vegetables are like that because there's such long transportation times that they'll go bad. Uh, Frozen fruits and vegetables are picked ripe and blast frozen immediately and bagged and sent to the grocery store. So you get a lot more nutrition out of them than you actually do the produce that's on the shelf for the most part. That's a really great point. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about how you got into this because we you're mentioning that, you know, you grew up um, around farms. You grew up in Kentucky. And um, did you just always love food? I mean, were you interested in food? <laughs> yeah. how, do you, how do you become a food scientist? Yeah. Because it's a, yeah. So it kind of just <laughs> fell into my lap. You know, when I was in high school, I was really interested in biology and chemistry. Okay. And, you know, did really well in those subjects. And I went to University of Kentucky. Again, it was, you know, we had what was called a keys program in Kentucky. So every A that you made in high school went towards your college tuition and lowered your college tuition. So it was like, oh, I really want to go out of state. And my dad's like, okay, we'll take a loan and good luck. (laughs) (laughs) Or you you have all these good grades. Or you have all these good grades (laughs) and you can have a full ride at Kentucky. I hope you like basketball. Right. (laughs) So I ended up going to University of Kentucky and I met this great guy. He was my academic advisor, still a really good friend of mine today. His name's Benji Michael. And I was touring the biology and chemistry department. Mm -hmm. And he said, you know, you might want to look at food science. And my grandmother, to give you a little bit more of a background on that, when I grew up in western Kentucky, I grew up with my grandmother. Mm -hmm. Um, Well, with my parents, but I was out at my grandmother's house for the most part. Mm -hmm. And um, we always used to enter the western Kentucky State Fair together. Uh And we cooked together, and we won seven years out of eight years that we ended. Wow. Like, the overall, you know. And so I have all these great recipes. I'm actually coming out with a cookbook in May of all of our recipes. It's called Sizzling Science. Awesome. It'll be on Amazon in the next, you know, two months or so. Uh Uh-huh. 
And so she really got me into food. And then as I got into college and I started looking at food science, I was like, well, this is really cool for two reasons. Mm -hmm. Uh, One, because, you know, you get to take this science that you love and apply it towards, you know, making a safer, healthier, more nutritious food supply. And I got really interested on the nutrition side. You know, okay, people aren't going to eat blueberries. So how do I take the healthy purple pigments from blueberries that we know prevent cardiovascular disease and insert it, them into products like yogurt okay. that people do consume mm-hmm. so that they get those antioxidants. Yeah. So that's where I really kind of started out, um, and and it's it's been phenomenal since then. I went on to Ohio State uh, to continue the whole antioxidant you know, research that I was doing in the flavonoid area, okay. work a lot with the purple pigments and blueberries and blackberries and purple corn and uh, really how they affect cardiovascular disease. And, you know, after graduation, I kind of went more into the policy route here in D.C. Mm-hmm. because I, I really feel strongly, you know, w- there's this farm that has the foundation grant over on George Washington's farm, and they're growing this four acres of organic vegetables, and they're handing them out in D.C. and lower income areas on a $7 million grant. And it's like, okay, well, is this sustainable? This can't happen in Western Kentucky. Right. Like, Right. We got to figure out some way to get fresh produce into those food deserts in a practical way, and we have to think. You know, policy needs to be evidence based, but it's also kind of have to get some get. We have to have some practicality to it. Yes, definitely. Yeah. So, so this is what I love is like you have this really hardcore science background. You've done a deep dive into the policy, and now you're really. Um, talking to the public about this in a very, very like easy to understand, yeah. very digestible way. And uh, so, tell tell me a little bit, like for for a student who's thinking about um, going into uh, into this area, what are some of the big challenges that you would like to see people working on? Um, and what are some of the things you're communicating there out there to people? Well, one of the things that I think food scientists have done really badly is communicate. Okay. Uh, And, you know, most researchers have a really hard time communicating, you know, with the general public to begin with. And that's one of the reasons I've kind of taken the angle that I have, because I feel like I can resonate with people Mm -hmm. and I can kind of take issues like GMOs or different types of technologies, why we use certain food additives. People are so afraid of food additives. It's almost like... You know, okay, but these are really making your food safe. Like, you don't Mm -hmm. want to get sick. We don't want you to get sick. And Mm -hmm. these are harmless. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And so it's really taking information like that and really getting it out to consumers. And I think that somebody has to do it. And, you know, I get a lot of backlash from the scientific community a lot of times because, you know, scientists disagree on topics. And everybody wants nutrition to be black and white or food science to be black and white. But it's not. It's very gray. And so what we have to do is give a the best informed opinion that we can to help people, you know, live longer and be healthier. And, you know, so I I think that hopefully my being out there really kind of drives some of our professional societies and maybe drives some of these younger scientists, these younger kids. I got a call the other day from um, a student at Ohio State that's starting this whole Um, you know, club, university club around scientists that want to communicate, that want to be in the media, that want to blog and things like that. Mm -hmm. I think it's really important because I think there's a lot of what I call nutrition quacks out there um, that give, you know, very pseudoscience advice, Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and again, nutrition is a gray area, but there's a lot of unqualified people. You know, you can take the food babe, you know, Marion Nestle, you know, any of these guys that just give a lot of information to get a lot of following and to make a lot of money yeah you know conflicts of interest really go far beyond just the food industry here if i can sell books if i can you know really which i guess i'm kind of contradicting myself because i have the book coming out but (laughs) you know it's i'm also qualified to to sit here and say you know look like choline isn't going to save your life it's not going to prevent you from you know getting alzheimer's but you know, being nutritionally sufficient has its benefits and it might decrease your risk of several of these, you know, exactly. cognitive, you know, impalements that we see later in life. And so I think having somebody out there with a balanced perspective is really important. And I hope that by me being out there so much that other scientists will step up and do the same thing. Yeah, that's so important because, you know, what you're contributing is the idea of like 
continuous evaluation of the evidence and not right. just saying that, okay, this week it's about, you know, you know, eat a thousand, like, I don't, just, uh, people keep telling me about this cauliflower, like feed your baby's cauliflower. I'm like, when did that come up? I mean, you know, it's like, when I, I mean, it's just like every week it's something new, you know? And, and so I think we really do need to have this more uh, evidence-based yeah. sort of approach. Well, to and, you know, I'm not against feeding your baby's cauliflower. I mean, it's I mean, great. But it's I a just, cruciferous vegetable and, yeah, you know, just, it, it's got some great, it, but it, it, it's a really important thing because, you know, we're seeing the research, you know, the earlier that you introduce foods to uh -huh. your kids and the more diversity that you can have in your child's diet one the more accepting they'll become of different foods when they're an adult they'll have a you know a, a more broad palate mm -hmm. and you know secondly you know we know that food addiction and food cravings start at a very young age so i mean i'm almost even timid like my best girlfriend we um had her son's first birthday this last weekend. And, you know, she had the big birthday cake, you know, and he, like, you know, tasted the cake for the first time. But, you know, again, growing up in Kentucky, my parents giving me fast food for, you know, lunch and dinner almost every day as a child. I mean, there's nothing I crave more than a Wendy's cheeseburger yeah. as an adult. And I don't let myself have it, but it's just, you yeah. know, those cravings are you know, instilled very early in life, I joke about Diet Coke all the time. And again, yep. nothing wrong with Diet Coke, but my mother wouldn't feed me uh, or give me um, regular Cokes when uh -huh. I was a kid. She gave me Diet Coke. And I, you know, my friends laugh all the time because I always have a Diet Coke with everything. And I think there's, <laughs> things are really... It gets in there. Yeah. And I mean, I was, I was joking that my parents wouldn't give me soda, but they gave me oodles of high C, yeah. <laughs> which is just, you right? know, so, so you think about, yeah. And, and uh, I, again, it goes back to that, everything in moderation, you know, yeah. and, and just think about what, what you're eating when. Well, yeah. and now we've got, you know, where we've taken... Um, you know, the MRIs, the functional MRIs, like what you might get, you know, in the hospital. And we put people under them and we put a feeding tube up uh, into the system and we give them solutions of, you know, sugar or salt mm -hmm. or, you know, saturated fat. And you see the same parts of the brain light up as they do with a heroin addiction. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously mm -hmm. not to the same extent. You right. know, we're talking, you know, a needle in a haystack versus, you know, a whole haystack. But, right. you know, still, you know, food is addictive. Mm -hmm. And it's instilled very early on. And so for new parents, I would say, you know, you really have to watch, you know, what foods you're giving because, you know, I see, like, all these, like, you know, cookies for infants and things mm -hmm. like that. And mm -hmm. I think that really starts the problem out early on. And if, you know, you're an adult, and you're obese and you have a child, that child's genetically predisposed. You know, it's got a lot of those genes that are upregulated already. So it's predisposed to diabetes and weight gain and things like that, lower metabolism. And so, you know, you really have to worry about what you give your child very early on, especially in the first two years of life. Yeah, it's so important. Let, so let's let's talk a little bit about metabolisms and dieting and eating, because, um you know, again, as someone who's aging, <laughs> um, you know, my my metabolism has noticeably slowed, you know, from my 20s. And I have to be much more careful about what I eat, how much I eat and things like that. But still, there are definitely points where particularly after, you know, let's just say after this winter when it's like uh, maybe a few too many Bombay Sapphire yeah, right. tonics, right? <laughs> You're like, okay, like what do I do to get rid of the 10 pounds or 5 pounds or whatever? I, yes, I know exercise, but but let's talk a little bit about dieting Rich white too. women problems. Right, the rich white woman <laughs> problem. It's so true, yes. <laughs> so, But let's talk a little bit about dieting because it is a fascination and, uh, you know, there are a lot of different approaches uh, – uh, to it, and I would like to just sort of hear where you are on this whole, on this whole topic. Right. So a lot of people are really surprised where I am on this topic because I'm the spokesperson, the new spokesperson for Adkins, mm -hmm. um, and I've always done lower carb diets myself because I find with metabol my metabolism, you know, it, it works. Mm -hmm. um, but it's very again, it's a personalized approach. So, you know, 
what works for one person doesn't necessarily work for another person. Women are completely different than men. Mm -hmm. Everybody's nutritional requirement is somewhat different. So, you know, the consumer has a little bit better of an idea about their body and what works and what doesn't than, you know, the practitioner or even the dietitian. And so I think that piece is really important. Again, I think totally moving towards, you know, genetic technologies where we're going to be able to individualize diets for people. I think that's coming in 10 years, Mm -hmm. uh, which is really neat. Um, But, you know, right now everybody's crazy about the keto diet. Okay. Um, And, you know, Again, very personalized. If you are overweight, you know, let's say you're 30, 40 pounds overweight, Mm -hmm. doing the keto diet for two months, you know, is it healthy for you? Okay, well, we know saturated fat raises your cholesterol levels. Um, You know, having a high fat diet might not be that great in the long term, but in the short term, if you're 40 pounds overweight, your cholesterol is probably high anyway. And if you can lose the weight and then back it back, you know, back your diet back down to where you sustain the weight, Mm -hmm. then that's optimal, I think. Where we go wrong with diets, well, outside of the keto and the Adkins-style diets, um, because the Adkins is a keto diet, Uh um, most diets don't work because what you do is you decrease your calorie intake. Um, So you restrict some foods and somehow you end up like – you know, eating fewer calories. And what your body does is it slows your metabolism mm-hmm. in response to that. Okay. So you might lose weight, but your metabolism lowers. So then when you start back on your normal diet, then you gain all the weight and more back because your metabolism doesn't just bounce back up. So that's, you know, again, why exercise is really important when you're doing any diet because it kind of keeps your metabolism up a little bit. Yeah. Um, The keto diet's very different because you're you're basically just restricting carbohydrates. So you're replacing those with protein and fat. So you're getting pretty much the same amount of calories in. So there's no fluctuation in your metabolism. Um, It works very well um, in overweight patients. I mean, you know, I don't do very strict diets. That's what's really nice about the Adkins diet. And for those of you who don't know, they have a new book. It's called Eat Right, Not Less. It's got some great recipes in there. And it's really flexible to your body, which I really like. Um, I do like the Adkins 100 when I want to – there's three different levels of Adkins. The really strict one that will give you 20 carbs a day. Then there's one that's 40 and then one that's 100. So if you're like you and me that just want to lose five pounds before beach season, you know, the 100, you know, where you're just eliminating sugar and potatoes and pasta, Mm -hmm. you know, and bread. Yep. You know, that works, you know, in a month. You can lose five pounds pretty easy and then go about your normal diet regimen. Uh, you don't gain the weight back so quickly because it's pretty easy to continuously sustain. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I, I think that, you know, for my body, the Adkins diet works, the the lower carb thing restrict. And if you think about it from a 10,000 foot view, um, most Americans consume right at what the dietary guidelines recommend for meat and protein. Yes. Um, we're very under, you know, for fruit and vegetable intake. But where we really exceed are the grains, particularly the refined grains, because sugar and, you know, starches, they're everywhere. I mean, think about, you know, if you have to go out to lunch here in D.C. and you've got to avoid bread and pasta, like don't even think about the sugar, just avoid bread, pasta, cookies, pastries, you know, that kind of stuff. It's really, really hard because it's in everything. So you really have to kind of think about it and make it a lifestyle. Yep. Yeah. Particularly going out, right? When you're yeah. out for business lunches, out for social events, and it's yeah. just always there. Yeah. Well, and these so. keto diets are a great mm-hmm. way to really handle pre diabetes or diabetes. Yeah. Like, and, you know, you see, because your body handles about one teaspoon of sugar at a time. Uh-huh. And so when you, like, if you go out and eat a whole wheat bagel, your body converts that to about eight teaspoons of sugar. So what does your body do with that extra seven teaspoons? It stores it as fat. Mm -hmm. And so the keto diet, you know, by using up all of those stored reserves, you know, really uh, brings your blood sugar down and, you know, kind of stabilizes all that. But it also makes your body go burn those fat stores. Yes. Which is really important. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so good advice for first world <laughs> rich lady, right? <laughs> first world rich yeah. lady. Well, and, you know, again, it's or, not the easiest yeah. to do, but I tell you, this book, the Eat Right, Not Less uh, right. book, they've got some recipes in there that are relatively inexpensive, you know, that you can get in the grocery store. 
um, fairly easy. And you know what? You can substitute any of these fresh fruits and vegetables for frozen yes. and get it at a fourth of the cost. Fourth. Yeah. I mean, perfect. I'm a huge fan, again, of frozen foods, uh-huh. um, especially if you're on a budget or if you have a big family. A yeah. lot of these diets are great. If you're like me and you're single and you're cooking for one, yeah. you can meal prep on Sunday and have all your meals for the rest of the week. Yeah. But when you got like two or three kids, you know, and, and they partner, all want to eat different vegetables, and they all want to eat different, they don't like anything, <laughs> like, you know, it makes it a lot harder. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, I think that's really where frozen foods like really make a difference. Make yeah. a difference. Yeah. 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 This has been a great conversation. I am totally going to look forward to seeing your uh, your book um, with distinctive recipes, some of which come from your uh, your thoughts and memories with your grandmother and winning all these amazing cooking and uh, and competitions in Kentucky. Yeah. Plus, you know, if you want a health cookbook, uh-huh. go to Adkins because nothing in my cookbook is healthy. <laughs> it's all Southern cooking. Well, I love it. Hey, <laughs> you know, it's great if you want to entertain, but if you want to be on the carb diet, you get better go, go for the Adkins first, stuff. Right. Yeah. Okay, better do that first and then get yeah. your cookbook. Right. Yeah, buy my cookbook on the off season and yes. then deep season go to Adkins. Go to Adkins. <laughs> like, hey. That sounds like a pretty good plan. Okay. Yeah, yeah so we'll look forward to seeing you. Um, everybody, uh, you can can, uh, check Taylor out not only um, in his blog he has some really great information there but uh, also on the Dr. Oz show you appear regularly as Absolutely. well Absolutely, right? I was actually just up filming yesterday yeah so uh, so check those places out and uh, we'll look forward to uh, getting your thoughts about uh, this podcast and, and questions for questions that people might have based on the conversation absolutely all right thank you thanks for having me Ultimately, the biotech revolution will allow consumers to make more informed decisions based on a better understanding of how their physical makeup and food interact to affect their health. Thanks to Dr. Taylor Wallace for talking with me today. Until next time, this is Christina Elson in the Ink Tank. You can subscribe to the Ink Tank on Spotify, Google Play, Stitcher, YouTube, and Apple Podcasts. Visit theinktank.org for a full transcript of this episode. A special thank you to the Kauffman Foundation for their support. From the Robert H. Smith School of Business at the University of Maryland, thank you for joining us in the Ink Tank.